sonnets, which I hate to do. Um, okay, so hopefully we'll finish Hamlet today. We're in Act 3. Act 4 is not too long. Act 5 will bog us down. Um, so if we don't finish Hamlet today, we'll definitely finish it on Thursday. Um, read more than Lear, Act 1, for Thursday. I would say try to read Acts 1 and 2. Lear is not as long as Hamlet. Um, it's, in a sense, more dense than Hamlet, but... Um, so hopefully then, you know, we'll at least get through King Lear, uh, not chapter, Act 1 on Thursday. Tuesday of next week, then get through Acts 2 and 3, maybe Act 4, so I would read through Act 4. Then Thursday of next week, we'll finish Lear, and I'll distribute the tragedies exam. You'll, eat, you'll get your, whatever exam it is, um, back either Thursday of this week or Tuesday of next week. I know when I got them, I said it won't be two weeks, but I'm still shooting for Thursday of this week. Um, tragedies exam will be distributed. The following Tuesday, Winter's Tale 1 through 3. The following Thursday, Winter's Tale 4 through 5. Winter's Tale is a lot shorter, uh, and it's, it's not as packed or as dense. None of the romances are. Um, following Thursday, we'll finish Winter's Tale. That's when the tragedies, tragedies exam is due. Tuesday before Thanksgiving, Tempest 1 through 3. That's when your research paper is due. It's still due then. The following Tuesday is our last day of class. We'll finish the Tempest. I'll distribute the final. And on the syllabus, I originally, you know, had that you would turn in or that the final exam would be over the romances and sonnets, um, probably in class, I said, or if take home doing my office. I'm going to move that up uh, from the 12th to Monday the 9th. And I haven't decided yet. That'll either be you can submit it by email or put a hard copy um, in the box on my door in my office or I'll be in my office that day and you come by and deliver it by a certain time. Right? I haven't just decided um, how I'm going to do that that day. It'll be the same format, two to three pages, anywhere between three and a half dozen, or was it this class? I had nine options. Or one of my classes, I had nine options for one of the exams. Okay. Um, the, the paper, I am going to make, should I close that? I am going to make one little change right now. I might make another one later. Minimum of five. External scholarly secondary sources. Okay? That's articles, chapters in books, whole books, <clears throat> Etc. But they've got to be secondary sources. Everybody clear what a secondary source is? I'm just doing notes. Okay. <laughs> Who is? Anybody? Want to offer the secondary source is an article or written work specifically about the topic you're writing on. Say, for example, you choose to write on madness in Hamlet, okay? Hamlet is your number one primary source, primary first. The secondary source is something written specifically about Hamlet. The physician's diagnostic manual is not a secondary source. Even though you might read in the physician's diagnostic manual, about the diagnosis of madness, right? It needs, secondary sources need to be about Hamlet. They need to be about madness in Hamlet. So you can read something by a psychiatrist. That's fine, as long as it's about madness in Hamlet, not the rampant madness running around college campuses today, not madness in the Middle Ages, not madness, right? It's madness in Hamlet, right? So the secondary source is always about the primary source. 
primary thing you're writing about. Maybe it's not Madness and Hamlet. Maybe it's, you know, fathers and daughters in Shakespeare's romantic comedies. Okay? Well, or in, as you like it, and A Midsummer Night's Dream. As you like it, Midsummer Night's Dream are your primary sources. All your secondary sources will then be about one or other or both of those two plays. Okay? It won't be some modern thing about, you know, the patriarchy in general. Because that's not about those two plays. It can be about patriarchy in A Midsummer Night's Dream or patriarchy in As You Like It. Right? Secondary sources got to be about the play specifically. Clear about that? Yes. Um, do you care like how um, like modern the sources are? Or... Um, good question. It would probably be better if they were sources, with with few exceptions, sources in the last forty to fifty years. Right. Now, I said a few exceptions. There are some very, very good critical sources, secondary sources, that were written in the first half of the 20th century. There are some very, very good critical sources that were written in the 18th century. Samuel Johnson. Samuel Johnson's one of the best critics there is of Shakespeare. Right? Samuel Taylor Coleridge um, might have something to say, uh, just off the top of my head. I don't think so. He wrote more about romantics and stuff. Um, you know, Freud, early part of the 20th century. Freud goes to town on some Shakespeare stuff. If you're interested in a psychological, you know, kind of approach to, um, to Shakespeare. But I would, I would probably, you know, you only have five. You're only, you're only required to have five. You can have more. For a seven to ten page paper, I could easily see ten. Right? But I'm bare minimum five. If you have four, you're getting an F. I'm just telling you right off the bat. I'll look at your works cited page. If I see four sources other than the Shakespeare, I won't read the paper. I'll just put an F on it because you shouldn't be here <laughs> if you can't follow those kind of simple directions. Right? Um, in, unless you get some really arcane esoteric topic, None of you should have any problems whatsoever finding five sources about any of the plays we've read. I mean, it's one of the problems of Shakespeare studies. You know, for a, a graduate student in Shakespeare, somebody who wants to, you know, specialize in Shakespeare is coming up with a dissertation topic, something that hasn't been done before. Because usually if it hasn't been done before, Again, with some exceptions, there are some very, very good uh, recent stuff, relatively recent stuff about Shakespeare, um, where people take a, you know, they kind of take a slightly different perspective that nobody ever looked at it from, um, things like that. But again, it, it could be an examination of a theme. It could be, you know, a, what a single play means. It it could be an examination of an individual character. It could be an examination of a character type, like the fool in Shakespeare's plays. Well, you got a great fool in King Lear. You've got Touchstone in As You Like It. You've got Bottom, who's a fool of sorts in Midsummer Night's Dream. You got various other fools. It could be an examination of an idea. Okay. Uh, Teresa, uh, you know. An element through Shakespeare's plays, like the experience of love or the portrayal of love. I mean, look at love in Midsummer Night's Dream, as you like it. Look at love in Winter's Tale. Look at love in The Tempest. Oh, brave new world that has such men in it. You know, Miranda, her first experience of men, other than her father, in Caliban. Wow. <laughs> Chloe? Um, is it, if you do something on a play that you haven't read in class? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. As long as it's Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, if you want to compare Shakespeare with a modern adaptation or a modern version, you got to get my approval for whatever your topic is first, anyway, okay? Um, 
But I'd, I'd even go for that as long as it's heavy on the Shakespeare and light on the modern adaptation. For example, and I've never had a student do this. You could do a comparison of The Lion King with Hamlet. Because, I mean, they're, they're pretty close, but it's got to be like 80% Hamlet <laughs> and 20% Lion King, all right? Um, just make sure you, you emphasize the original, so to speak. If you want to look at one of the plays or an element or something, or if you actually want to delve into Shakespeare's biography, go for it. I'd, I'd probably, you know, just, you know, approve that almost on its own. You know, not just Shakespeare's biography. Because every one of these, it's, it's got to have an argument. It's got to have a thesis. It's got to be a point you want to prove. If you're just looking at Shakespeare's biography, what's the point you want to prove? That he really, well, <laughs> you could, <laughs> should I even go there? Yeah, I'll, I'll even go for this. If you want to argue that, if you want to prove that Shakespeare really was Shakespeare, if you want to go against the anti-Stratfordians, okay, um, or show why the anti-Stratfordians are wrong, but you, you've got to bring in stuff from the plays. Okay. Like the language. I mean, one of the big proofs for Shakespeare being Shakespeare is there's a lot of Warwick, Warwickshire isms in the plays. Not this is it's not entirely the language of a, a London University esteet, you know, somebody who was raised in London and taught, you know, London English and all that kind of stuff. There's there's a lot of Woodburyisms, <laughs> kind of in some of the plays. Okay. Did you use any of the sonnets or anything? De yeah, depending on the kind of topic. I mean, if you're talking about the experience of love in Shakespeare, and, and you can even write about the sonnets. It doesn't have to be the plays, because, I mean, I originally, I always try to include the sonnets. And, and part of me says, drop one of these. But I don't really want to drop one of these. Because um, this is probably the last thing Shakespeare wrote. And you get that very powerful scene where Prospero breaks his wand, which a lot of early Shakespeare scholars took. That's Shakespeare saying, I'm done. The well is dry. <laughs> I've got nothing left. Okay? Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But if you want to write, you know, if you do want to bring in the sonnets with the plays, you know, the, I don't know, the vagaries of love or something like that, well, you got a couple plays and then you got 154 sonnets that are all about love. Essentially, every last one of them is about some experience or perspective of or on love. Okay. Um, yeah, you can do that. Other questions? All right, pick up where we left off. That's not, not Lear. We're in Hamlet still. Um, so Hamlet has... Just left, Ophelia delivers her, oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown speech. And the king and Polonius come in. Or, depending on how it's produced, they step out from behind the curtains. Okay. And the king has heard everything Hamlet said. Right? I mean, love, his affections do not that way tend. How do we know the king is on stage? Because he couldn't have heard the speech if he wasn't physically on the stage. Because when you go in the tiring house, that means you're gone. Right? They, you don't hear what's going on in the stage then. So, he says, it lacked form a little. <laughs> That's not madness, though. What is, what's Claudius really hear from him? What's he take away from Hamlet's little speech? Do you think, oh, poor Hamlet, he's thinking of suicide. But he doesn't want to because he's afraid of what God's going to do to him. Uh, um, no, that's not what he takes away from it. What's he think? Hamlet's dangerous. To me. There's something in his soul or which his melancholy sits on brood. 
like a hen on eggs. Well, what do eggs, eggs, what do eggs do if a hen sits on them long enough? They hatch. He doesn't want what Hamlet's melancholy is brooding over to hatch. And I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger. So to prevent that, to stop it, I'm going to send him to England for the demand of our neglected tribute. He says, maybe travel will lighten his spirits. That's the thing about happily the seas and countries different but variable objects shall expel this something settled matter in his heart. Polonius. Yeah, I still think it's love. I still think the source of this is neglecting love. Okay. How now, Ophelia? You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. That, again, I think is a stage direction. He's telling the audience we only look like we were off the stage, but if you look really carefully, you would have seen our toes sticking out from under the curtains. Okay? So he says to the king, My lord, do as you please. That is, do what you're planning to do. But after the play... The play within the play, The Murder of Gonzago, Mousetrap, as it's also called. He says, um, I'm going to spy on him some more. Let his mother entreat him. Let him go up to her room, and I will position myself so I can hear more. Because he still thinks, it has something to do with my daughter. King, it shall be so. Madness and great ones must not unwatched go. Why? Why should madness and great ones not go unwatched? Because they have power. They have power. Power to do ill, power to do good, right? What do you mean madness and great ones? What are great ones? Does he mean morally great? Great mind. Great mind. I mean, what does Ophelia say about his mind? He's the epitome. He's the model. For the courtier soldier scholar's mind. Okay. Hamlet, she's kind of saying there, he's brilliant. Well, what can happen with brilliant minds? Yeah. Okay. Great minds. Hamlet's a prince, future king. Leaders. What leaders could we talk about the last 120 years who were great ones? And while they may not have suffered from true psychological madness, their actions showed people were crazy. You can go back, you know, Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Mussolini, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, depending upon your politics, Reagan, Bush, Kennedy, Nixon. Bush, Clinton, Clinton, whatever, okay? So we got to keep an eye on him, okay? Hamlet comes in with the players. And notice, we're not going to look at it real carefully. I'm going to point out a few lines. But notice what Hamlet is telling the players from lines 1 through 14 and then 16 through 35. And a lot of people, most people, say this is Shakespeare slash Hamlet. And that this could be Shakespeare slash Hamlet telling the other actors in the Lord Chamberlain's men, because he's there's still Lord Chamberlain's men, 1600-1601, don't butcher my plays. Look at what he says. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you. So Hamlet's telling us, he read the speech to the player and showing him, here's what I want you to do. Okay, What do actors never like? Hard reading. Told how exactly to do it. Now, some actors do, but the really, yeah, I'll put it, the really arrogant ones. The really haughty ones don't like directors telling them 
how to do their job. It's director's job to direct. It's actor's job to act, etc. Okay? Nor to saw the air with the hands. So don't use all kinds of hand movements. Okay? But gently. It offends me to the soul. And I, I definitely think this is Shakespeare. To hear a robustious periwig painted fellow tear a passion to tatters to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, etc. First player, I get you. Hamlet, but don't be too tame neither. But let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. Suit your behavior to the word, to the words on the page, and to the meaning of the word is what that implies and your word to the appropriate action that is described. Why? The purpose of playing who's in, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature. Now, I think that's Shakespeare, the playwright, Shakespeare, the actor, telling his audience. You do understand what we're doing here. This isn't just mere fun. It isn't just mere distraction. You're supposed to learn from this. What are you supposed to learn? What, that just gave it away. What do you see when you look at a mirror? Yourself. So when you see these actors, you should see what? Human nature imitated. Be me. If I were put in that kind of situation, that could be me. Now he's getting some of those ideas from Aristotle. Okay? To show virtue her feature, scorn her own image, her scorn her own image, in the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure of the time, that is, of the milieu in which the work is written. Shakespeare's telling us. Hamlet, the play, shows us what? Life in Elizabethan England in 1600-1601. So the Tempest shows us life, essentially, in Stuart, England, around 1611-1613. Uh, Measure for Measure shows us life in England, early 1590s. Comedy of Errors shows us life in England, Late 1580s, very early 1590s. All right? Turn on the TV today. It shows us life in America today. Because sitcoms and stuff, they're, they're plays. They're just plays for television. Scary idea if you think about it. What we see on TV is a mirror and reflection of who we are. That's why I don't watch much TV. So... The players leave, Polonius comes in, Horatio comes in, Polonius leaves, and Hamlet says to him, For what advancement may I hope from thee that no revenue hast but thy good spirits to feed and clothe thee? Why should the poor be flattered? No, let the candied tongue lick absurd pomp and crook the pregnant things, excuse me, hinges of the knee. Dost thou hear? So he goes on. Since my dear soul was mistress of her choice and could of men distinguish her election, she has sealed thee for herself. That is, you're the closest one to me, Horatio. For thou hast been as one in suffering all. You've suffered along with me. That suffers nothing. A man that fortunes, buffets, and rewards has tamed with equal thanks, and blessed are those whose blood and judgment are so well commettled. Okay. Give me that man that is not passion's slave. That is, the man who can overcome his passions. Passions there doesn't mean love. Doesn't mean hate. It means everything dictated by the spleen or the heart at times. Right? Give me the man who is a good, solid stoic. Who takes Act 3, verse uh, scene two, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and doesn't do what? 
doesn't fly off at the handle in response and doesn't curl up in a ball in response. Who takes everything like Polonius's advice. Doesn't respond, doesn't react. And I will wear him in my heart's core, I in my heart of heart as I do thee. Okay? So keep that little speech in mind. Go back to Hamlet's speech after he hears the ghost. What does he say? The ghost tells him, take not your mind. He goes, I'll wipe away all saws, all trivial fond memories, everything I've learned, and I'll put one thing in my mind, kill Claudius. Well, that's the opposite of what the kind of person Hamlet just described. Okay? So we get to play within the play. Have to spend a little bit of time here because it's some of Shakespeare's dirtiest stuff. It's always fun to talk about. Um, act three, scene two, bottom of page 1122, left-hand column. So the king and queen come in, and the queen goes, Hamlet, come sit next to me. And Hamlet says, no, good mother. Here's metal more attractive. Polonius, you see that? Where's the metal more attractive? It's Ophelia. Metal, attractive. He's talking about metal and magnets. She's drawing me to her, Hamlet says. And he says to, Pol to Polonius, Ophelia, lady, shall I lie in your lap? Okay, now, you can look at that. And he's saying, shall I lie, go horizontal, in your lap? And she goes, no, my lord. Well, what does he mean, really? Put his head in her lap. But he means that even. Double entendre two ways. I, I mean my head upon your lap. I, my lord. That is, I, I know what you mean. Because head obviously has two meanings. Remember, Samuel Johnson said, if Shakespeare could pun, he would. He never met a pun he didn't like. So if he could pun on the word head, okay, penis and this kind of head, he will every time. That's why Shakespeare loves to also pun on the sound of those two words, but when it's spoken, you don't know which one it means. So if you hear a woman who asks, do you like my tail? But she might have just said something, and a guy refers to, yeah, I like it a lot, not necessarily referring to what she just said. Okay? And he does use that as an example in one of, uh, Shakespeare uses that as a pun in one of his plays. So, do you think I meant country matters? I think nothing, my lord. In other words, I don't know what I think. Well, you need to know, in Shakespeare's day, the word country, anybody know where I'm going? Was often spelled that way. Hmm. I used to work, I was, for several years, I was a, an assistant textual editor in the very own edition of the poetry of John Donne, a contemporary of Shakespeare's. And I would pull up manuscripts on microfilms and transcribe the, play, the poems of Donne. And Donne loves this pun. Okay. He even has a poem, you know, um, thought we that we then but sucked on country matters. Sucked, okay, begins with an S, right? Well, in Shakespeare's day and Dunn's day, when an S comes at the beginning of a word, it looks like that. The only difference between that and an F is that. So when Shakespeare has, in one of his plays, there were the B suck sucked I, okay, yeah, there were probably some manuscripts, because they're definitely already done, where you get this, where this is intended. That is, the copyist makes an S into an F, because the copyist wants to pun on the two 
very different words, not the same sounding words. Okay? So, do you think I'm in country matters? Look at your gloss 114. Sexual intercourse with a body pun on the first syllable of country. <laughs> Notice how Bevington tries to be kind of antiseptic. He doesn't, he doesn't want to say bad words. Okay. I think nothing, my lord. Okay. Nothing, however, is pronounced no ting in Shakespeare's day. No ting. Okay. Like noting. I, I think noting, but paying attention to it. But nothing. Also, how do you represent nothing? Zero. It's a whole, right? He says, did you think I meant country matters? She says, I think nothing. Well, that's the, the nothing. That's exactly what Hamlet's thinking about. That's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. Well, what's a fair thought? Nothing. No ting. The whole. Nothing? What is, my lord? Nothing. You are merry. In other words, Hamlet, you're feeling better, aren't you? Because the last time he saw her, what did he tell her? Get to a nunnery. Why? Because the sun's going to impregnate you. And now he's talking obliquely about sex, right? Possibly oral sex. Definitely sex sex. Who? I? I, my lord. Oh, God, your only jig maker. What should a man do but be merry? For look, look at my mother. And my father is dead within two hours. No, oh, she says, it's twice two months. Read that long. Died two months ago and not forgotten yet. Then there's hope a great man's memory may outlive his life half a year. Well, that kind of puts the whole kibosh on the whole sex talk, right? There's, he goes straight from that into death. Well, what's the connection between sex and death? There's that Renaissance idea that every time you orgasm, a little bit of your spirit dies. So you'll have poets say, kill me and kill me again. That John Donne has, so that we may die and rise again and die and rise again. Okay. So we see the play within the play. We hear the player king say his lines, player queen, and then we get the dumb show part of the play within the play. Where the king lies down, the brother comes in, Pours the poison in his ear, and 234, Claudius, what do you call this play? Mousetrap. How? Well, it's a, it's a real play. It's done in Vienna. Gonzago is the duke's name. It's called The Murder of Gonzago. And he pours the poison. Hamlet explains what's happening. Notice he's sitting close enough to the king and queen. The poison's him in the garden for his estate. His name's Gonzago. The story's excellent, written in very choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife, and Claudius gets up. Okay. And leaves. Rosencrantz and Gildenstern come in. For what purpose? They're testing, they're pressing, they're spying. Okay. So, one of the players, or the players come in, they've got recorders, they're playing the recorders. And Hamlet grabs one. The players keep going. And Hamlet hands the recorder to Guildenstern. Page, uh, line 349. If you get an opportunity to watch the Richard Burton, man, this scene just knocks it out of the park. Burton is so good here. 
Will you play upon this pot? I, I cannot. I pray you. I, believe me, I cannot. I do beseech you. I know no touch of it. It's as easy as lying. Hamlet's implying, you can easily do that. Govern these vintages with your fingers and thumb. Give it breath with your mouth. And look, it'll discourse. Excellent. But I, I, I don't have the skill. Look you now. How unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. <laughs> there is much music, excellent music, in this little organ. Yet cannot you make it speak. Splut, do you think I'm easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me, you cannot play upon me. What's Hamlet telling his friends? Get the hell out of my face. I know exactly what you're here for. So Polonius tells him, the queen would like a word with you. Right? They leave. Hamlet's left. Tis now the very witching time of night. What time is it? Midnight. What time does a ghost usually come? Between midnight and 1 a.m. When church yards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Church yards yawn. The idea, the folk belief, that at midnight, ghosties come out of their graves. Now could I drink hot blood. Do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. Now I could drink hot blood. He's telling us, my mindset is, I could kill. But I got to go to my mother. Act 3, scene 3. King, I'm not safe with Hamlet around. Gildenstern, we'll keep pressing him on. Polonius comes in, he tells the king, he's going to his mother's closet, I'm going to go, I'm going to hide behind the heiress, I'll hear what happens. They all leave, Claudius gets a soliloquy. And what's he tell us? I did it, I'm guilty. My offense is rank. He trawls down on his knees and he prays. And Hamlet walks by, sees him. Oh, now might I do a pat. A pat. Instantly. Quickly. Now is a praying. Wait. Stop. He's praying. I could kill him. If I kill him while he's praying, that's not revenge. He goes to heaven. Dad's in purgatory. Well, that sucks. No, no, no. I gotta kill him when? When he is drunk, asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed. Kill him when he's having sex with mom. Kind of hard to do without hurting mom. <laughs> Go said, touch not your mother. No. So Hamlet puts his sword back in the scabbard and goes on. And Claudius gets up. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below, words without thoughts never to heaven go. Why? What are the thoughts? What's he mean? My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. They're just words. There's no meaning. There's no sincerity. This is not a heartfelt prayer. Why? What's Claudius still enjoying? Incestuous sheets. <laughs> power in the office. If he really meant the prayer, what would he do? Admit his fault to Hamlet? Show real contrition? Maybe be like Duke Frederick, go find a holy man, live off in the forest, you know, become a convertite, as Jacques calls him? So, 3-4. Polonius and Gertrude are in Gertrude's room. Polonius hides. Hamlet comes in. Now, we could spend time, we won't. You know, this would be a good topic for a paper. Hamlet's, uh, Shakespeare's use of pronouns. Just in this scene, how often they go back and forth between the Y forms and the TH forms. Right? 
what's the matter, Hamlet? <laughs> uh, Hamlet asks his mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy mother much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. He's distancing himself from her. She is talking down to him as a familiar, as an older parent to child. Really to kind of little child, like Hamletine. Little Hamlet. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. He's actually using the Y form Y because he's indicating his moral superiority. How, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? No, by the rood, that is, by the cross of Christ. Not so. You're the queen. Your husband's brother's wife. Ouch. That stung. So, they keep going back and forth. And the queen thinks, what wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help. Oh. Because Cam... Hamlet tells her, come, sit down, you shall not budge. You're not going to go till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. Until I do what? Well, let's do a little play, and it's called Gertrude the Slut. Gertrude, my mother, the slut, you know. And she thinks you're not going to murder me. Polonius, what ho, help, Hamlet. He doesn't even think. How now, a rat? Please, God, please let it be Claudius. Oh, I'm slain. What hast thou done? I, is it the king? Oh, what a rash and bloody. Why rash? Unthought out. Polonius says to Laertes, give thy thought no unproportioned action. This is an unproportioned action. A bloody deed, Hamlet says, almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. Notice who he's saying killed the king. She did. Hamlet's implying she is responsible for his father's death. Kill a king, I was my word. And he sees Polonius, the wretched, rash, intruding fool. Farewell, I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. Thou find'st to be too busy is some danger. Too busy. Busy how? In other people's business. We have the phrase, a busybody. It doesn't mean the person is constantly working. It means the person is sticking their nose in other people's business. That was Polonius's job, right? So he tells his mother, sit you down, peace, sit you down. Let me wring your heart. For so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff, if damned in custom have not braced it, so that it be proof and bulwark against sense. Let me wring your heart means not wring it like this. Let me break it in two. Why? David's psalm, after Nathan the prophet comes to him and tells him, I know what you did with Bathsheba, and her husband. David prays that Psalm 50 that ends with a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Hamlet saying, let me break your heart. Why? So that she can be remade whole. What have I done that thou dost wag, wag thy tongue and so annoy so rude against me? And so he explains. Okay? And he shows her the two likenesses. A picture of his father. A picture of her husband. Not the same. Big long discussion about that. And he finishes. Line 82. Oh shame, where is thy blush? Rebellious hell. If thou canst mutine in a matron's bones, to flaming youth let virtue be as wax and melt in her own fire. Proclaim no shame when the compulsive ardor gives the charge. Hamlet, stop. Speak no more. Worked. 
you got to me. That pierces my heart. Thou turnest mine eyes into my very soul. Notice what the play does. A play makes us see ourselves. But what do we see when we see ourselves? We see the reflection, right? Her eyes have been turned inward. In that same prayer by David, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Okay? Why? Because David turns inward and sees the horror and the rot. I'm a murderer. I'm an adulterer, etc. Well, kind of the same thing here. And there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their taint. They're spots. She's saying this heart can never be clean. Hamlet, nay, nay. No, that's not true. But to live in the rank sweat of an enseamed bed, and yeah, enseamed sounds like enseamed, wet, slimy, bleh, bed, stewed in corruption, stewed, he's playing on the cooking metaphor, but also those places that people visited in Shakespeare's day called the stews, brothels. It wasn't an accident when I said, in Hamlet's mind, his mother's a slut. It's like she's a whore, a hooker. Stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. Why sty? Who lives behind a sty? Pigs, wallowing in their filth. Speak no more. These words like daggers enter in my ears no more. And Hamlet's on a roll. Murderer and a villain, a slave that is not twenty of part the tithe of your precedent, Lord. That is, Claudius is talking about. And the ghost comes in. But notice the ghost comes in in his nightgown. He's not coming in cup of pee, armed, head to foot. Why is he in his nightgown? Every other time he's been seen, he's been armed. Well, where is he? He's not out on the battlements. In his wife's old bedroom. Yeah, or possibly his old bedroom. You know, kings and queens are weird. They each have their own room, and they visit each other. I don't know. 1950s, you know, TV censors and stuff. So, Hamlet says, a king of shreds and patches, save me and hover over me with your wings, you heavenly guards. What would your gracious figure? That is, what do you want, Dad? Uh, he's bad, Gertrude says. Because who does Hamlet start speaking to? What would you do if I came in and I just started, you know, talking like this? You probably go, Sherman's finally lost it. Because that's what Hamlet does. She doesn't see the ghost. Do not forget this visitation is but to wet thy almost blunted purpose. Almost blunted. You've almost forgotten the reason, the charge I've given you. What's well, that? Is it? Is that fair to call that almost blunted? I mean, he saw Claudius and he's like, I can't kill him now. He'll go to heaven. That's not revenge. Uh, Calm your mother down, Hamlet. Told you. Leave her alone. Speak to her. How are you, lady? I'm fine. How is it with you, Hamlet? <laughs> uh, why, why do you bend your eye over there and speak to what's not there? Oh, I'm talking to him. Look. His form. To whom? Do you see nothing? Nothing at all. Getting a little worried here, Hamlet. <laughs> Look, he right there. This is the very coinage of your brain. The imagination, Theseus says what? Can give to airy nothing form and shape. She's saying, Hamlet. Okay. Now, you, you can see this handled different way in different productions. Sometimes the ghost is not seen by anybody. 
except him. So you don't have a physical ghost on the stage. You hear the ghost's voice, right? Come from beneath the stage or come from loudspeakers in the back of the theater. Which adds to, is Hamlet mad? Is he the only one who sees and hears this ghost? And if he is, that's pretty much an indication that it's all in Hamlet's mind. Kind of hard to deal with the opening act with that. Okay. She says, this is an ecstasy, Hamlet. Ecstasy? Okay. Ecstasy is when the soul leaves the body. Not at death. John Donne wrote a poem simply called The Ecstasy about two souls, two lovers, sitting by a riverbank, holding hands, looking in each other's eyes all day long, and their souls leave their body and negotiate what they're going to do when they go back down into their bodies. Okay? What's Hamlet prove for why this isn't an ecstasy? It says, come on, come on, feel my pulse. It's calm, it's 60. If I were crazy, my heart would be racing. It is not madness that I've uttered. Bring me to the test, and the I, the matter, will reward, which madness will gamble from. <laughs> no, 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 no. She goes, don't, don't think I'm crazy. Why? Why does Hamlet say she thinks he's crazy? What is she doing to slash for herself? Foolish. She thinks I'm crazy. And she doesn't have to pay any attention to anything I've said. That kind of excuses her from her thinking, oh, I looked inside and I see darkness within. Well, Hamlet's crazy, so... Maybe it's really not all that dark. Hamlet said, no, 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 no. Confess yourself, 150. Excuse me, go back. Lay not that flattering unction to your soul, 152. That not your trespass, but my madness speaks. It will, that is, if you think that, it will but skin and film the ulcerous place. While the rank corruption... Mining all within infects unseen. You will simply put a band-aid over your problem while the problem will get worse and worse and worse. No, mother, here's what you need to do. Confess yourself to heaven. Okay? Now, it could be that that is an element of Catholic Confession is a very important part in Catholic belief. Protestant, not so much, especially if it's confession to another person. Hamlet's not saying, go find a priest and confess. Confess yourself to heaven. Repent what's past. Repent. Turn away from the past. Avoid what is to come. Well, what is to come? Everything from that moment on. So what's past? Father's death, okay. Easy to repent from that, right? You can't do it again. You don't keep on doing it. But what else? Well, what came after Hamlet Sr.'s death? Uh, marriage to Claudius. And what does Hamlet kind of apply? What has happened every night since then? The rank and seam in bed. Turn away from that. So from this point on, stay away from his bed. How do we know? Do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them ranker. That is, the bed's already rank. Don't spread more shit on it. How? Forgive me this my virtue, for in the fatness of these prissy times, virtue itself of vice was pardoned bay. O Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. Create in me a broken heart, O God. Okay? She's saying, my heart is broken. Hamlet, throw away the worst part of it. What's the worst part? The Claudius part. The other part's the Hamlet senior part. Get rid of the bad part, Hamlet says. And live the pure with the other half. Good night. Don't go to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not that mean? How do you assume a virtue? 
Okay, we think assume really only has one meaning in modern English today. It's what? To take an idea and kind of hold it. In Shakespeare's day, it meant something else. It has that idea, but it also means put on something. Like clothing. Like one can assume a character. Take on that character. One can assume a personality. Hamlet says, assume a virtue. You are... Think of a famous quote-unquote fallen woman. Famous sex tape. Parasol. You are Parasol. He says, assume for the moment Mother Teresa. Go from one to the other. Put on the outward appearance of virtue. If you have it not. That is, even if you don't have that virtue inside of you, pretend you do. Why? That monster, custom. How is custom a monster? You start smoking. That first cigarette, never smoke cigarette, cigars are my passion. That first cigarette, however, makes it what this for the second one? Makes it a little bit easier. And the third one? A little bit easier. And the fourth one? The as with every, that first drug, that first shot of whiskey, right? You want to spit it out the first one, but then, so, that monster custom or habit, who all sense doth eat, it overcomes sensory pleasure, sensory feeling and such. Of habits, devil is angel yet in this. Custom is the devil of habit. It leads you down the wrong way. He says, but it can be an angel. It can be angelic. How? To the use of actions fair and good. He likewise gives a frock or livery that aptly is put on. If you start pretending to be good, and you pretend it all the time, then what? You People who quit smoking cold turkey. You, that, first, that first cigarette, when I was working on my PhD, my major professor, who I worked with daily, when I worked in his office, he was the general editor of the Dunbar Yard. Chain smoker since he was like 14. And he was in his 50s then. And he came in the office one day, no cigarettes. Chewing gum like it was, you know, going out of style, right? He assumed a virtue that first day was hard. I mean, I he, he probably went through 10 packs of gum, just chomping away like crazy. And the next day, that was hard too. It wasn't as hard as the first day. Third day, a little bit easier. And after a while, got to where he didn't even chew any gum anymore. And he stopped smoking cold turkey. He assumed a virtue. But after assuming it for a while, what happens? It becomes ingrained. It's no longer an assumption. It's now natural. Refrain tonight. And that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence. The next more easy. For use almost can't change the stamp of nature. Use, habit, can, what's the stamp of nature? The fall. The sin of Adam. Hamlet slash Shakespeare is saying virtuous behavior can almost wipe that out. It can't totally, not in any aspect of Christian, typical Christian belief, Protestant, Catholic, etc. Can't do it on your own. And Either the devil or throw him out with wondrous potency. Good night, Mother. And when you are desirous to be blessed, I'll blessing beg of you for this same Lord. 
For this same Lord, sorry, he points to Polonius, I do repent. I didn't mean to kill him. But heaven hath pleased it so to punish me with this. That is, I'm being punished with this. And this with me. And he's punished by me. That is, he was my scourge, and I am his scourge. That I must be their scourge and minister. I'll take care of them. No, no, you don't have to go to sleep with a dead body in your room. And will answer well the death I gave him. Answer well? I've got to die too. So again, good night. I must be cruel only to be kind. The bad begins and worse remains behind. This bad begins. I think Hamlet saying, one down, more to go. There will be more deaths before the end of the play. Okay. She asks, what shall I do? Hamlet says, let the bloat king tempt you again to bed, pinch wanton on your cheek, call you his mouse, let him for a pair of reaching kisses or paddling in your neck, blah, 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 blah. Don't sleep with him. She says, oh, no, Hamlet, you've given me life. He goes, oh, that's right. I've got to go to England. You, you do know that, right? She goes, oh, I'd forgotten. What does Hamlet know? There's letters sealed. And my two schoolfellows, whom I will trust as I will, adders fanged. I'm going to trust Rosencrantz and Guildenstern like I'd trust a couple of diamondback rattlesnakes. They bear the mandate, that is, the letters. They must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. They will lead me. They will prepare me to knavery. Let it work. Don't let don't don't stop it. Why? For tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard. A petard is an explosive device. The engineer is the one who designs and plants it. It's the sport, he says, to have the bomb maker blown up by his own bomb. And it shall go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. He's just told his mother what? Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Well, let's back up for a moment. Polonius? This was the first. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Mm. They're going to die. Okay. Tis most sweet when in one line two crafts directly meet. This man shall set me packing. I'll lug the guts into the neighbor room. Good night, mother. This counselor is now most still, most secret, and most grave. <laughs> Little pun there. <laughs> Who was in life a foolish, prating knave. It's almost like if he had only followed his own damn advice. Act four. King and queen come in with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. How's Hamlet? Gertrude, uh, he asked Gertrude. She said, <laughs> Mad as the sea and wind when both contend, which is the mightier. He killed Polonius. Oh, would have been me if I'd been there. Okay. For two. Okay. Hamlet safely stowed, you know. And Hamlet talks to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And they say, where's the body? Body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is the thing. Shakespeare is toying there with the Renaissance notion of the king's two bodies. Political idea. The king's two bodies. One of those bodies was the king's physical body. The other body is the body politic. Which is why you have the king of the country the name of the country stands for the king. The king is the country. When Claudius says he'll go to England, that means he'll go to the king of England, and he'll go to England itself. Norway refers to the king of Norway and Norway itself. Denmark is king of Denmark, Denmark itself. So, 
The king says, you know, we, we can't put the strong law on him. Why? This is line four of Act 4, Scene 3. Because the people love Hamlet. Hamlet has the kind of devotion Henry IV had when he was bowling broke. He had the kind of devotion Henry V had early on. He says, we, we can't do anything publicly or they'll turn against us. Right? Rosencrantz say, you know, he did something with the body, but he won't tell us. Bring him in. King asks, 17 or so, where's Polonius at supper? Where? Not where he eats, but where is eaten? The certain convocation of worms are eaten at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet or diet. A certain convocation of worms. Remember I talked about in 1521, Martin Luther was invited to the convocation of the Diet of Worms? Shakespeare's punning on that. Okay? A convocation of worms. A convocation of politic worms. Shakespeare's kind of saying... The Diet of Worms was all politics. It had nothing to do with religion. What's politics about? Power. It's power relations among people. Okay? Ethics is personal relations, how people interact with one another. Politics is how you apportion power among people. So, your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures, else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Now we could jump straight from here to Act 5, Scene 1, the gravedigger scene. We've seen this idea earlier in the play. What's Hamlet telling us? What ultimately is the purpose for human existence? To feed Even your emperor, he says, becomes a diet for worms. What's he telling the king? You too <laughs> will be eaten by worms. The king just doesn't know when. The king. Hamlet goes on. Your fat king, your lean beggar, is but variable service. Two dishes to one table. Variable service. One's turkey, one's sausage. One's roast beef and ham, one's mashed potatoes and gravy. They're all designed for what? Worms to munch on. And that's the end. Alas, alas. Now, the king might be saying alas, alas, because he's really lost it. Good thing I'm sending him to England to be killed. Or he could be saying, alas, alas, how dare you say Kings are meant to feed maggots. Hamlet. A man may fish with the worm that hath eat of a king and eat of the fish that hath fed of that worm. Okay. <laughs> Unpack that. A man may fish with a worm, so he goes and digs up a worm, that worm has eaten of a king. Found its way into a grave, ate part of the body. The man catches the fish, uh, catches the worm which is caught by the fish, he eats the fish, which has eaten the worm, so the man eats the dead king. What do you mean? Nothing but to show you how a king may go th a progress through the guts of a beggar. Nothing to show you but that a king is a piece of shit. That's what Hamlet means. That goes a progress through the guts of a beggar. If it goes through the guts, it comes out. <laughs> Where's Polonius? In heaven. Well, that's generous of Hamlet. Send thither to sea. If your messenger doesn't find him there, then you go to the other place and search for him yourself. It's almost like he wants to end on you, right, son of a bitch. But he doesn't. If you don't find him there, you'll nose him as you go up the stairs into the lobby. You'll note 
And you might want to hold your nose as you go up the stairs because it's starting to stink. Okay. So, 4-4. Four, four. Fortune Bra comes in. And we see Hamlet and the captain making their way to the boat. Okay. The boat that's going to take Hamlet to England. And Hamlet sees Rosencrantz, excuse me, sees Fortinbras and the little army. And he speaks to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern a little bit. And they all leave him for a moment. And Hamlet gets a soliloquy. What's the soliloquy about? From lines 33 to the end of Act 4, Scene 4. Fortinbras is getting ready to do what? They're, they're going over some Polish territory, he, says that, he suggested. And it's a little bit of territory. We're told it's not enough. <laughs> to my shame, I see the imminent death of 20,000 men, line 61, that for a fantasy and trick of fame, go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot, whereon the numbers cannot try the cause, which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain. Okay? 20,000 men are going to die here, and the land isn't even big enough to bury them. It doesn't take much land to bury 22,000 people. A square mile would be way more than enough. All these men are going to die for what? For this little spot. Go back. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. What is a man if his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed? His chief good. The Westminster Confession of Faith, which is written after this period, which is the, the Confession of the Presbyterian Church, written in 1642, something like that, says, The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But Protestants had other confessions before that. And the chief end of man was to glorify God. What does he mean by the chief good? What is our chief purpose? What if it be but to sleep and feed? What's Hamlet asking? Are we nothing more than beasts? We're going to hear Lear be told. What needs you really more than one servant? What? Right? And Lear's going to go, Wreck not the reed. Consider not the need, he's saying. If you go just on the basis of need, what do we really need anything? I mean, food, shelter, clothing. That's pretty much it. And if it's just food, shelter, and clothing, then really what are we? We're just beasts. But we're more than that. Hamlet, a beast, no more. Sure, he that made us, God, with such large discourse, looking before, where did I come from? And after, where am I going? That is, after the sleep of death, the born from whose country no one returns, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. To fust, to get all musty and moldy. God wants us to think, Hamlet is saying. He wants us to think about where we came from, who am I, what is my purpose, and where are we going, and what happens when we die. Now, whether it be bestial oblivion, traditional kind of definitely Protestant thought, animals die, and that's it. Nothing happens to them. Or some craven scruple of thinking to precisely on the event. That is, what lies beyond the door? Hamlet's first soliloquy, right? Or the cannon had fixed his, or the uh, everlasting had fixed his cannon against self slaughter. And then the to be or not to be speech. A thought which quartered hath but one part wisdom and ever three parts coward. I do not know why yet I live to say this thing's to do. What's the this thing? Why haven't I killed Claudius yet? And then he looks at the men and goes, every one of these guys is going to die for what? 
not to revenge their fathers. They're going to die for honor. Okay? For honor. Rightly to be great, line 54, is not to stir without great argument. Or, as Polonius put it, beware of entrance into a quarrel. But if you get in, bear it so that the other know not to do it again. Right to be great, Hamlet is saying, is to keep your nose out of other people's business. To have good reason to get involved in an argument. Okay? That was 54. But greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honor's at stake. Quarrel in a straw. When your honor is at stake, when your personal integrity is at stake, that means you find the smallest thing. That cup offends me. You're dead. Why? Because it, it affronts my honor somehow. How is Hamlet's honor affronted? He's sleeping with my mother, defiling her. That's my honor, to defend my family name. And these guys are all getting ready to die for what? For fantasy and trick of fame. People will talk about them later. Oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. Okay? So Ophelia comes in next to act and scene. And she's kind of what? La, 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 la. She's gone crazy. Why? Oh, to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. Hamlet overthrown. And now the father's dead. At Hamlet's hand. Right. So, 102, line 102, the king tells Horatio, keep an eye on Ophelia, 102, the messenger tells the king, uh, Laertes is back, ooh, and he's he mad. Word has reached Laertes, Polonius is dead, and the people are crying out. Choose we, Laertes shall be king. Well, why are they choosing Laertes? What about Hamlet? They all know Hamlet's been sent to England. They don't know that Hamlet's been sent to England to be killed. They just know he's been sent to England. Okay? So the king says, now i got to figure out what to do with Laertes. So Laertes comes in, and who does Laertes sound like? That we've read in a previous play. Hotspur, to a T. I'm just replaced the name. Okay, where's my father? Dead. How do you? Laertes wants to kill the king. King talks him down from it. We're gonna skip a bunch. Okay, and Ophelia comes in. Laertes doesn't know that Ophelia's crazy. Well, now he does, because she's tight singing about fennel and columbines and rue and stuff. And he's like, "What happened to her? Eh, she went crazy because your father's dead." Now Laertes has two causes for revenge, right? Hamlet killed my father, prepare to die. Hamlet made my sister go insane, prepare to die. Well, he's the one, first one who told his sister, Hamlet just wants to have sex with you, honey. He doesn't want to marry you. Okay. Act 4, scene 6, real quickly. Horatio comes in, and he's reading a letter from Hamlet. And essentially says, King's going to know I'm come back and everything will be revealed. Okay, 4 7, King and Laertes command. I'm skipping a bunch intentionally. And what do they do throughout Act 4, Scene 7? They plot against Hamlet. What's the plot? What are they going to do? 
Okay, back up just before that. He's going to have Laertes challenge Hamlet to a fencing match. All right? Laertes says, ooh, yeah, good, good idea. I've got some poison that there's no antidote to, and I'll tip my foil with it. Now, in a fencing match, normally the foil, which is a long, thin square of metal, it's, it's not sharp on an edge, but it has a pointed tip. In a fencing match, that tip is normally um, blunted with a plug on the end. He says, I'll take the plug off, I'll dip it in the poison, and I'll hit him. Cool. And I'll get a goblet, and I'll put some poison in, and I'll have a Hamlet drink. In other words, Hamlet's going down, but, you know, no matter what. Okay? So they plot that. Okay? Act 5, and we're going to stop here. Act 5, scene 1 begins. So we'll do Act 5, uh, we'll do the last act of Hamlet and start Lear on Thursday. Act 5, scene 1 is going to take some time. Because the, the so-called clown scene, the grave digger scene, is just packed. A lot of meaning. And we'll have to unpack it.